from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. This week, we spent the better part of a day in New York City reviewing AWS's AI strategy in progress with several AWS execs, including Matt Wood, who was the VP of AI at the company. We came away with a much better understanding of AWS's AI approach beyond what was laid out at reInvent 2023. We also met separately with a senior technology leader at a large financial institution to gauge resonance with AWS's narrative. And while the stories from both of these camps were very positive, the data still shows that OpenAI and Microsoft continue to hold the AI momentum lead. That's a trophy the pair usurped from historic time to market champion AWS. The question is, can AWS take back that lead? How will it attempt to do so? And what external factors could propel or thwart its aspirations? Hello and welcome to this week's theCUBE Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we review the takeaways from our AI field trip to NYC. We'll share survey data from ETR on Gen AI adoption barriers and place these in context to the recent scathing review of Microsoft's security practices by the government's Cyber Safety Review Board. Let's first talk about LLM diversity, open source, and domain specificity to set some context. Early last year, the Cube Research published the power law of Gen AI shown here. The basic concept is that while some industries have a handful of leaders and a long tail, bit players, we see the Gen AI curve differently. On this chart, we show model size on the vertical axis and domain specificity on the horizontal plane. And while a few giants like the hyperscalers are going to dominate the training space, a very large number of use cases will emerge and are emerging and will continue to do so with greater industry specialization. Open source models and well-funded third parties will pull that torso up to the right as shown in the red line. And they will support the premise of domain-specific models by helping customers balance model size, complexity, cost, and best fit for the use case. Now, I wasn't able to obtain the deck that Matt Wood shared with us, so I'm going to revert to an annotated version of a slide that Adam Solipsky showed at reInvent last year to kick things off. This depicts AWS's three-layered Gen AI stack, which comprises core infrastructure for training foundation models, and doing cost-effective inference. Building on top of that layer are tools to leverage LLMs, which is Bedrock and the other tools inside of that managed service, and at the top of the stack, Q, which is Amazon's effort to simplify the adoption of Gen AI. So let's talk about some of the key takeaways from each layer of the stack. First, at the bottom layer, there are three main ones. AWS's history at ML, and AI, and two, it's custom silicon expertise, and three, the compute optionality, and of course, time to market with uh, those EC2 instances. And we're gonna take those in order. Amazon emphasized that it has been doing AI for a long time, a lot of companies do so, uh, but Amazon has had a presence in ML with SageMaker, which is you know definitely has been a leader, and that is true that they've been in that market for a long time. But SageMaker, while it's very powerful, is also complex. Getting the most out of SageMaker requires an understanding of really complicated ML workflows. You got to choose the right compute instance. You got to integrate into pipelines and IT processes and so forth. A large proportion of AI use cases can be addressed by SageMaker and Gen AI presents an opportunity to be an orchestration layer to simplify and widen the adoption of traditional ML tools like SageMaker. Now as well, AWS has a long history developing custom silicon with Graviton, Tranium, and Inferentia. And in addition, it offers EC2 options that sometimes make your head spin, including GPUs from NVIDIA. AWS claims it was the first to ship H100s, and it will be the first, it says, to market with Blackwell, which, NVIDIA, which is NVIDIA's new super chip that they announced at uh, GTC last month. Now, AWS's strategy at the core infrastructure layer can be boiled down to key building blocks like Nitro and inter-networking to support a wide range of XPU options with its own custom silicon that can do work at much lower costs. Now let's move up to the next layer on this chart. This is where much of the attention is placed because of this layer competes with, with OpenAI, 
We've got Amazon Bedrock here. It's the managed service platform by which customers access foundation models and tooling to ensure trusted AI. And we've superimposed on Adam's chart several foundation models that AWS offers, including AI21 Labs, their Jurassic uh, option, Amazon's own Titan model, Anthropic Claude, perhaps the most important of the group given AWS's $4 billion investment in the company, Cohere, Meta's Llama, Mistral uh, AI with several options, including its mixture of experts, MOE model, and its Mistral lar Large, which is its flagship, and then finally Stability AI Stable Diffusion model. We do expect to see more models in the future, including maybe, who knows, even DBRX from Databricks. And of course, Amazon will be evolving its own foundation models. Last November, you may recall a story broke about Amazon's Olympus, which is reportedly a two trillion parameter model headed up by the former head of Amazon Alexa. And this will be one of many AWS bar raisers in the LLM game. Finally, the top layer is Q, an up the stack application layer designed to be the so-called easy button with out of the box Gen I for specific use, use cases like Q for supply chain or Q for data with connectors to popular platforms like Slack and ServiceNow. Essentially a set of Gen AI assistants that AWS is building for customers that don't want to build their own. Now let's look at the reality in enterprises. In, in a March survey of almost 1400 IT decision makers, nearly 70% said their firms have put some form of Gen AI into production. And this chart shows from ETR the 431 that said they hadn't gone into production and asks them why. And the number one reason was, of course, they're still evaluating, but the real tell is the degree to which data privacy, security, legal, regulatory, and compliance concerns are key barriers to adoption. It's no surprise, but unlike the days of big data where deployments went unchecked, most organizations are being much more careful with AI. Now, given this concerns about privacy and security, one can't help but reflect on the recent report initiated by the head of Homeland Security to investigate the hack traced to China one one year, a year ago on Microsoft that comprised the accounts of key government officials, including the Commerce Secretary. This report, it's, I don't know, a 30-page report. I heard about it in the news. I got in early this morning and, and read it. I, I highlighted some key takeaways, and uh, it's, it's astounding to the degree in which the government in this report excoriates Microsoft. I mean, it eviscerated the company for prioritizing feature development over security, using outdated security practices, failing to close known gaps, poorly communicating what happened, why it happened, how it's gonna be addressed. Still to this day, there's, there's uncertainty. This story was widely reported, but it's worth noting in the context of AI adoption. And here are the few couple of call outs, pull quotes from that report. Quote, the board finds that this intrusion was preventable and should never have occurred. The board also concludes that Microsoft's security culture was inadequate and requires an overhaul. Interesting, they use the term was, because based on reading to the port report, we haven't heard how it has changed. Second point, call out. Throughout this review, the board identified a series of Microsoft operational and strategic decisions that collectively point to a corporate culture that deprioritize both enterprise security investments and rigorous risk management. The report also evaluated other cloud service providers and specifically called out in a positive light, Google, AWS, and Oracle and gave specific best practice examples of how they pro approach security. Now, why is this so relevant to AI other than the obvious? Look, the cloud has become the first line of defense in cybersecurity. And there's a shared responsibility model that we have all heard about and I think generally understand with, with cloud. And if you're a CEO, a CIO, a CISO, a board member, a P&L manager, and you're a Microsoft shop, this breach, which by the way, wasn't even discovered by Microsoft, it was discovered by its customer, you're relying on Microsoft to do its job in the shared responsibility model. And Microsoft is failing you. Your business is at risk. And this is especially concerning because of the ubiquity of Microsoft and its presence in virtually every market. Satya Nadella, you saved the company from irrelevance when you took over from Steve Ballmer and initiated a cloud call to action. 
Microsoft, however, has violated the trust of its customers, many of whom are now putting their AI strategies in your hands. And you got to do, you have to do better. You have the resources to do better and you, you have to change the culture is what this report said. Now, if you're a business technology executive, this should be a wake up call. You need to think about hedging your bets. You need to think about your AI strategy. You need to about, think about reducing your risks. But look at the data and you'll see many customers are ignoring this threat. Here's data from the very latest ETR technology spending intention survey, TSIS, of more than 1,800 accounts. And I got permission from ETR to publish this ahead of their webinar for private clients. The vertical axis is spending momentum. We call that net score on a platform. This is just for the AI and ML space. The horizontal axis is presence in the data set. It's measured by the overlap with that platform has within those 1,800 plus accounts. Net red line at 40% indicates a highly elevated net score or spend velocity. And the table insert in the bottom right shows how the dots are plotted, net score, by the number of N, the number of mentions in the survey. The first point, OpenAI and Microsoft, they, look at them, they're off the charts, literally in terms of account penetration. And this underscores the risks that we just talked about. Point two is really interesting. AWS and Google within the AI sector are much closer than they are if we were looking at just the cloud segment. AWS is far ahead of Google when we cut the data on cloud accounts but Google appears to be closing the gap when it comes to ML and AI. They both have very strong net scores, a very solid presence in the data set, but the compression between these two names is notable. Point three, look at the moves that both Anthropic and Databricks have made in the ML AI segment. Anthropic in particular with a net score rivaling that of OpenAI, albeit with a much smaller N, that is AWS's perhaps most important LLM partner, as we talked about earlier. Databricks as well is moving up and to the right. My, now, my understanding is that ETR will be adding Snowflake in this sector. Snowflake, you may recall, essentially containerizes NVIDIA's AI stack as its AI strategy, or one of its AI strategies, a, a primary AI strategy. Um, and so that's one of their main plays. It's gonna be really interesting to see how they fare in the days ahead. Now, the last point is in the last survey, Meta's Llama was ahead of both Anthropic and Databricks on the vertical axis. And it's interesting to note the degree to which they've swapped positions, essentially. We'll see if that trend line continues. But coming back to the previous discussion on security and trust, this data is a wake-up call to those exposed to Microsoft, and we must hear from the company as to what its plan is to remediate this massive customer risk, especially in this age of AI. Okay, now coming back to AWS, who, as you see from the previous chart, is doing well, but if you believe that AI is the next new thing, which we do, then one, the game has changed, and two, AWS has a lot of work to do. So what are the, some of the themes that we heard this week from AWS that we can consider and think about the company's future in this market? Matt Wood laid out an eight-step journey that they see from a customer AI uh, a perspective, customer AI initiatives. And they're not really, really not a journey. They're not really linear steps, but he used that term, which is, I'm fine with. But I wanted to just point that out. It's not like these are sequential steps along the way. They're just certain things that customers are doing that AWS has been exposed to, that they're helping them do. Think of them as key milestones or objectives that the customers have. So it starts with training. And we don't want to spend a lot of time here because most customers are not doing hardcore training. Rather, they start out with a pre-trained model from the likes of an Anthropic or a Mistral or you know, whatever. Step two is perhaps the most important, IP retention and confidentiality. And despite that ETR data that we just showed you, many folks have banned the use of OpenAI tools internally. But I know for a fact that developers, for example, find OpenAI tooling to be quite good and better for most use cases or many use cases uh, I give you an example of code assistance. I know devs whose company, their company has banned the use of chat GPT for, for coding and because of, of concerns over privacy. But rather than use, for example, Code Whisperer, which they could do, Amazon account, um, in many of the cases that I've evaluated, 
what they do is that because they find open AI tooling so much better, they download the iPhone app and they do it on their smartphone. And again, this should be a concern for CISOs. Customers should be asking their AI provider if humans are reviewing the results, what type of encryption is used, how is security built into the managed service that you get access to the LLM through, how is training data protected, is it separated? Can data be exfiltrated? If so, how? What are the exposures there? How is access to data that, that flows through the system? Is it being fenced off from outs the outside world? And you know, and even the cloud provider, can the cloud provider get to that data and, and how so? And what, what controls are there? So these are key issues that the customers have to be thinking about that I'm fairly confident AWS has thought about from the ground up. Okay, step three is widely adopting Gen AI to, to applying it to the entire business. And when you look at it, what they're really, most companies are doing, they're doing, you know, text summarization, document summarization, maybe image generation, maybe code assistance. They're pretty standard things. But the reality is, you know, customer use cases are piling up. The ETR survey data shows that 40% of customers are funding AI by stealing from other budget buckets. So the backlog is growing and there's a lot of experimentation going on. Now, interestingly, historically, AWS has been a great place to experiment from the cloud. Uh, but from the data we showed, OpenAI and Microsoft are getting a lot of that business. A lot of that experimentation is going on with OpenAI and, and Azure. AWS's contention is that other cloud providers are married to a limited number of models. They'll say things like, there won't be one model to rule them all. By the way, we agree. Clearly, Google wants to use you know, its own AI models, but it's got other choices. Microsoft prioritizes OpenAI, but at Ignite last year, it announced you know, other model support. And this is one where only time will tell. In other words, does AWS have an advantage over other players with foundation model optionality? Or if it becomes an important criterion, can others expand their partnerships and add optionality? Now, they already have, but, but, but perhaps not to the degree that AWS has, the competitors, I'm saying. So AWS tried to position its model diversity and optionality as a potential flywheel where some models can assist other models and play off of other models and maybe perhaps train other models or uh, leverage data or the right tool for the right job. So we'll see. And the other thing is AWS has got like 400 instance, AC2 instance types. And, Will this be an advantage? Right tool, again, for the right job for cost optimization, for example, or a better use case fit. Now, some would say they'd like Gen AI to help them optimize for all those instant types, and no doubt that's coming. And of course, we're seeing simplified RAG models or expanding the adoption of Gen AI, which gets to step four, which is that kind of getting that consistency and fine tuning those RAG models as an example. Matt Wood talked about the Swiss cheese effect, where if a RAG as data, it's pretty good. But where it doesn't, it's like holes in the Swiss cheese. And then that's when models start to make things up. Step five gets deeper into industry problems. And again, I, I stress, this is not like a sequential journey. And this is one, however, where you know, people want to go beyond some of these you know, more basic document summarization or even you know, coding assistance. And they want to get into deeper industry problems, solving cancer you know, restructuring an entire business, uh, drug discovery and the like. And so there are some advanced organizations doing that. Step six is, is cost optimization. I'll use that term. AWS didn't, but it's where, you know, AWS touts its custom silicon. You don't need necessarily NVIDIA GPUs like Blackwell to do inference, use inferentia. Um, a lot of times you can train on Trainium. You know, maybe you're not going to get like 100% of what you get. Well, not maybe, you won't get 100% of what you might get from an H100 or Blackwell, but you know, might get 70, 80% of the way there, and it's good enough. And it's, you know, who knows, half the cost, maybe even less. So that's, that's something that AWS, I think, generally, as we've talked about, you know, has an advantage and a lead on uh, much of the competition because it's been designing custom silicon back early last decade maybe mid last decade. Step seven is rolling out common use cases like document summarization, code assistance. Those are things that are very, very common. Step eight, step eight is simplifying with Q. Think out of the box Gen AI use cases. So those are the 
So a quick run through of the eight steps or goals, initiatives that customers are pushing AWS to help with. Now, some other key points that we want to touch on, bedrock, bedrock adoption appears very strong with tens of thousands of customers claimed by AWS. We also met with industry experts at AWS in financial services, and we had cross industry pros that we were able to, to, to probe. We talked about numerous use cases in insurance, financial services, media, healthcare, you, you name it. And that's right in line with the power law that we discussed earlier. AWS is positioning itself as a platform to support scale. You know, one of the interesting examples was Adobe Firefly. Uh, Adobe Firefly was trained on AWS, and we talked about this last week in our breaking analysis, that Adobe is doing personalization at scale. And the last three on this chart, we've touched on a little silicon and LLM diversity, ecosystem uh, partners and companies like, like, like Adobe training on AWS with products like Firefly, um, security, and up-to-stack applications with Q. And my sense is Q is still a work in progress. Packaged apps are really not AWS's wheelhouse, but it's a start, and perhaps Gen AI makes it easier for them to enter upstream markets. Okay, we got to wrap. Let me leave you with a few points. Microsoft and, and OpenAI, they stole AWS's decade-plus time-to-market advantage, so can they get it back? Things to watch. Watch Anthropic. Not only AWS's use and its customers' use of Anthropic, can Anthropic help AWS, for example, develop better silicon and low-cost silicon? How important is model choice and model diversity? That is a linchpin of AWS's strategy. And of course, watch AWS's own foundation models. Uh, and, and it's custom silicon, how fast that gets adopted, and the ecosystem adoption. You know, another big question is, will models become commoditized? There's a real debate in the industry about this. So on the one hand, you got folks saying, oh, foundation models, LLMs, they're all good. They're going to be commoditized. That's sort of race to the bottom. There's another school of thought that says, well, maybe not. Maybe it's a right tool for the right job, and maybe the combinatorial effect of foundation models could actually deliver incremental value. Now, if that's the case, can competitors match AWS's diversity? Or is, will there be a moat? You know, one would think with open source models, there's actually not much of a moat there, but maybe through its silicon knowledge, and other tooling that is tuned for these various models, maybe AWS can uh, reduce the commoditization effect and take advantage of this. AI trust has to be a decision point, but will ease of doing business win out? And what about private AI and AI cloud alternatives? And speaking of AI cloud alternatives, like GPU clouds, our friends at Vast are doing very well in this space. At NVIDIA GTC, John Furrier and I attended a lunch hosted by Vast with Genesis Cloud, which was very informative. These firms are really taking off and positioning themselves as a purpose-built AI cloud to compete with the likes of AWS. So I asked the folks at Vast if they could give us a list of the top alternative clouds that they're working with, in addition to Genesis, names like Core42, CoreWeave, Lambda, Nebule, are raising tons of money they're gaining tractions, and look, maybe they won't all make it, but some will, to challenge the hyperscale leaders. Can AWS increase the adoption of AI with Gen AI as the orchestrator? In other words, can it take some of the complexity in its, its platform and, and use generative AI as the orchestrator and Q as a simplifying abstraction layer? In other words, can Gen AI accelerate AWS's entry into the application space, or will its strategy continue to be enabling its customers and ISP partners to compete up the stack? Maybe it's not an either or, maybe it's a both. Okay, that's it for now. What do you think? Does AWS's strategy resonate with you in AI? Are you concerned about Microsoft's security? Will it make you reconsider your IT bets? Let us know. All right, thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production. And Alex does our podcast as well. Kirsten Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hoff is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Does some wonderful editing. Thank you all. Remember, all these podcasts are available. All these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you have to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. 
I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn post. And please check out etr.ai. Their data just keeps getting better and better and more granular. They get the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.